Hope. Plan B with Serena Bellissimo. The biggest stars. Gossip. Events. And the biggest tunes. Plan B. Your weekend fix. Spin 103.8. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're really, really busy, so it's great to have you on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Making a Murderer, I can't believe that this debuted on Netflix just before Christmas, right? So given the subject matter, you're not thinking that this is going to be a Christmas hit, but it has taken over. The, like <laughs> no, <it's>, not at all. <laughs> it's gone worldwide. Did you ever think that this documentary that was so important to you guys would have such an impact? No, I mean, this is beyond our wildest dreams. I mean, we we had hoped that it would reach people around the world and that the, the story would touch them and move them. Um, I think what's most shocking is how quickly that happened. I mean, I think we imagined it would be sort of more of a slow burn and a slow build. Can we go back to the very beginning? Initially, you didn't know the impact this was going to have worldwide. So what was it about this story that you went, we need to tell this story? Well, the thing that really made us and inspired us to choose Stephen's story to tell was what we identified as what seemed to us unprecedented and also incredibly valuable, you know, that, that his experiences would, would provide a window into the American criminal justice system. You know, here was a man who had been failed by the system terribly in the mid-'80s, and now, 20 years later, after a series of events, here he was stepping back into that system. And, you know, in those 20 years, DNA had made advances. There had been legislative reforms. You know, there was a lot of rhetoric about, you know, wrongful convictions are a thing of the past. Our system is so much more reliable now. And, you know, here was an opportunity, really one that we couldn't not take up, yeah. the opportunity to really to check that and, and to look at the past with 2020 hindsight and then to challenge people to experience what at the time was the present in, in verite filmmaking, watching something as it unfolds. Were you ever nervous? Because, you know, this is a can of worms that the criminal justice system didn't want to open. Were there any times that you were actually fearful for your own lives? I would say we never feared for our lives. There were some special challenges we faced. In September of 2006, we wrote to then-prosecutor Ken Kratz, inviting him to participate in the series, and uh, we never received a reply from him. But what happened two months later, in November of 2006, is he tried to subpoena our footage. And that was a challenge we had not anticipated. So we had to hire a lawyer and file what's called a motion to quash to ask Stevens' trial judge, Judge Willis, to throw out that subpoena. And had the state prevailed in its argument, we would have essentially been shut down because we were a very small crew. We had hundreds of hours of footage at that point, and to dig through the footage and duplicate it and make it available to the state when we were gearing up to cover Stephen's trial would have had the effect of killing our production, essentially. Besides the criminal injustice that you're highlighting, one thing that did shock me was the amount of access you had to the footage. How did you even know the phone conversations existed? Because they are the things that are helping us move the story along. That's absolutely right. I mean, those phone calls are sort of a, a treasure trove for access to characters. And, I mean, we knew they existed because both of our characters, Stephen and Brendan, were both incarcerated. And, you know, all telephone calls from these settings are recorded. So all of those stacks and stacks of of CD recordings end up in, in the case files. So we knew they existed, and when we were able to get our hands on the case files, we could duplicate and start going through these CDs. But, you know, that said, it's a year and a half of several phone calls a day. Yeah. So it was a lot to, to log and go through. How and we were really excited by that material. I mean, we felt that it was really unique access to our characters because, of course, when they were having these conversations with each other, as opposed to, you know, if I were interviewing Stephen, for instance, which was also recorded, but when, you know, in a scene where Stephen's sister Barb is confronting him about Brendan's supposed role in the crime, you know, these are two siblings who are having a very raw, heated conversation with one another, and it's, it's unfiltered. I mean, they're not concerned that at some point this will wind up in a documentary series. So we really were excited by the material and, and wanted to do our best to incorporate it into the series. What do you say to the people who are saying, because like while you've gained a lot of acclaim, there's also been criticism that 
the documentary is very one-sided and you've left out some evidence that would be detrimental to Stephen's persona. What do you say to that? Well, we start by saying we absolutely disagree with those statements. I mean, I've seen the former prosecutor, Ken Kratz, on the news here in the United States, and I've seen his list of supposedly you know, incriminating evidence that we left out. And I would point out this list was never evidence that he stressed during his prosecution of Stephen Avery. You know, we took our lead from him. The items of evidence that he mentioned in his press conferences or that he mentioned in the trial as, you know, these are the things that prove that Stephen Avery committed this crime. Those were the things that we put in. I mean, we are storytellers. It's in our interest, and we think we did, you know, show incredible conflict. We showed the state's strongest evidence. We showed the defense strongest defense points against it. We showed all of our characters as multidimensional, full of flaws, full of hopes, the whole gamut. So you know, we had no incentive to, to tell a one-sided story. We were documenting what was going on. And I would add that most of these people that are saying this are people that we invited to participate in the documentary, and it was their choice not to participate. So we did our best to include their point of view through their press conferences, through archival footage and other means to try to get their point of view into the series, to try to make it as full a picture as possible. So it's a little disappointing that now they're accusing us of things that just aren't true. Laura and Maura, I can actually talk to you guys for ages, but I know you have to talk to others. So before I let you go, do you think he's guilty? Well, you know, how we feel, you know, what we learn through this process is, is the humility to know and to accept that we don't know what happened that night, and that's incredibly frustrating, but... We did follow this case. We did see all the evidence the state brought forward, and we saw some of the fishy stuff that was going on, and and we're left with questions. So with those questions, we would say we don't feel as if the case was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So in that legal sense, had we been on the jury, we may have said not guilty, not proven. That is, you know, we don't know. And finally, are we going to see another series of this? Because the story's not finished. Possibly. (laughs) Possibly. We're prepared to keep following the story. If there are developments that seem worthy of another episode or a a sequel, you know, it's real life. It's hard to predict what's going to happen. So Mm -hmm. we'll we'll sort of a wait and see approach. Well, Laura and Maura, thank you so much for joining us on Plan B today. Oh, it was our pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Plan B with Serena Bellissimo. Your weekend fix. Fix. Number one. Number one for music and entertainment. Spin. 103.8.